Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the last broadcast on quality number 32 from Paramahansa Yogananda Biography by Swami Kriyananda, Chapter 17. We were starting it a little while ago, but the live stream wasn't working, so now we've started over. This is a new recording. So we are on uh, quality number 32, which is the last in the series. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Teshwar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dear friend Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your presence inwardly as we make this pilgrimage journey from birth to death. Help us to make this incarnation meaningful in the only way that is lasting, which is to change our consciousness from delusion to realization to final freedom. Guide us and bless us that everything we do leads us step by step to the light. Om. Peace. Amen. So now we are number 32. Although the Master was very accepting of others as they were, when it came to their aspiration for perfection, he was uncompromising. In my own efforts to develop devotion, I had finally reached the point where I felt I had some cause for self-satisfaction. Master, however, was not satisfied. Soon afterward, he said to me, If you love yourself, how can you love God? so beautiful. It's just after, you know, all that we've been talking about, it's just an, an absolutely beautiful culmination to the whole. So the first part of this, where Master was completely accepting of people as they were, but he was also utterly uncompromising in what he knew was their spiritual potential. This is a a, a, a narrow lane that we all have to learn to walk in the way that we also relate to each other. Because sometimes people think that if you're unconditionally loving, that means that whoever people, whatever level of understanding people have, um, is sufficient. That that we're, we're still loving people for for conditions. Let, let me think how to say this. This is this is a dilemma that I see people get in, get themselves into so often, and it's so important for them to under for us to understand the difference. If a person, y you want to help people insofar as they are receptive to your help. I remember once I was determined that someone should uh, make a priority in their life certain personal changes that I thought would be very helpful to them. They were very strongly resisting me. And as these things happened, somehow Swami Kriyananda got into the middle of this. I can never remember how, how he quite gets into the middle of these things, but he was. And I said to Swamiji, don't you think that person would be much better off, you know, if they, if they work toward what I'm suggesting? And Swami said, yes, of course. So I, I sort of felt like suddenly I was vindicated. But he said, but you have to wait until they themselves see it as a priority. Just as simple as that. Now, so Swami was giving me the balance point. It wasn't that my desire to see this person rise to their full potential was in any way false, or my um, discrimination about where, where they had a weakness that if they could overcome it, it would help them enormously. Swami saw all of that as true. But he saw that I was imposing, I was imposing my will and my perception on them. So, okay, 
So we get the idea that we're not supposed to impose our will and our perception on people. But then does that just mean that we just sit back and say, oh yeah, you know, you're three steps up the hundred step ladder, but let's just call that done. And you know, that, that is like becoming, like shutting off your own intelligence in regard to other people. So Swami tells us that Master, he accepted people as they were, but he was uncompromising in what he understood to be their potential. And in our own hearts, we have to understand how those, those two things can coexist. And one of the ways that I've realized that they coexist is that it, it's faith in God. And faith in God becomes faith in other people's ultimate destiny. You know, I can be at peace with the way you are because I know that your soul will never rest until it finishes this great journey. And insofar as my input might be invited, you know, I will keep encouraging you toward that highest goal. And I will not, I will not um, compromise my love for you by telling you that you're just fine as you are. I, I, it was interesting when I was watching two different mothers working with their children. And, um, and let me phrase it differently. It was more I heard about it in retrospect, having seen the fruit of how the sons had turned out. One son, whatever he did, his mother told him that it was just perfect. And he developed a very false idea of how much work is required to achieve excellence and a very false idea of his own um, realization, I would say, not just spiritually, but of who he was. The other, the mother was extremely supportive. The, the child always knew that he was loved. But when the child did not do his best work, the mother said, you can do better than that. And as a consequence, that man developed a tremendous work ethic and an ability to persevere against obstacles. He developed the character to realize what his own potential was. Now, this is ideally what the guru does for us. Um, Swami says, I thought I had some cause for satisfaction. And Master says, no, you can do better than this. There's much more. There's your potential, you barely begin to touch it. Now, ultimately, you can see that to be true friends to one another, we have to never give up on their highest potential, but we have to be strategic in how we present that to them. And this is a, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. And it's a balancing act that Master carried out perfectly because, well, yesterday or the day before, we were talking about the ability to really enter into someone else's reality, to really feel you know, who they are and, and what's going to work for them, the way Swami worked with me when I told him that I was failing in some high aspiration that he had suggested I try to achieve. He said, well, so much for theory. Let's work with reality. And he immediately gave me a next step that I could take. But he never told me that where I was was sufficient. He didn't praise me for my limited accomplishments. Now, this is also um, a factor on the spiritual path that I have seen there's a great temptation. There's a great temptation to, well, uh, to imagine that the small hill that with great effort I have finally reached the top of is the top, is the top of my own potential. In other words, there's a temptation to bring the teaching down closer to what I've already accomplished so that I can feel that I am really more than I am. And this is where Master was uncompromising. And even, even Swami was very encouraging. He was very positive, but he never flattered us. He never told us that we were just so wonderful and so great. He was always absolutely sincere and absolutely honest so that you could feel satisfaction in what you'd done, but you could tell that there was much more. And this is like, this is an essential teaching on the spiritual path. It's the, 
the upward climb, if we, if we think of it as a mountain, the, when, when, you're, when you're climbing upward to a very high peak, it's not a straight line. It's not a straight line of ascent. It's not a, a flat surface like a, a, a pyramid where you can see the bottom and you can see the top and you just labor up that steep mountain. It's much more like you, go, you climb a hill, you go down to a valley, Sometimes you have to go all the way into a canyon. You have to ford a river. You have to find your way up the next hill. You reach another. In, in mountain climbing, they call that, you know, the false peak. That you, you repeatedly think, this is it. This is the final climb. But when you get there, you see that the real peak is still in front of you. And this happens continually on the spiritual path. Sister Gyanamata talks about it a great deal. Just realizing that there's always still more. There's always still more. And how to remain enthusiastic about that and to keep your energy up. I, one of the dramas that I went through for many years with Swami was his effort to teach me how to be a good writer. And, and in retrospect, he had a, a picture for me that I did not have for myself. I did not have it at all. But he, he, he knew that it was important for me. And he just kept at it. He was uncompromising. And I would write for him. I was working for, the, for promotions and sometimes occasionally an article and um, a, a pamphlet and things like this. And much of what I submitted to Swami to be used for those purposes never saw the light of day. I would write it and then he would rewrite completely, generally just throwing away what I'd done. Although he tried to, he tried to be nice by saying that whatever I had written that wasn't being used was very helpful because it helped Swami know what he didn't want to say. <laughs> Damning with faint praise, I'll tell you that. He would always be exactly accurate. This is okay. This is good. This is very good. This is excellent every once in a while. And it was just, I would do my best. He would tell me, compared to what he knew I could do, he would basically tell me where it fit. I, now I can sort of just look back on it. It was very, very difficult when we were going through it. And it was like, well, I thought of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who said, God will never give you a situation that's bigger than you can handle. And then she said, but sometimes I wish God didn't have so much faith in me. <laughs> Meaning, God puts in your lap something that he, he knows that you can do, but I wish, it, I wish he didn't believe I could do this. I wish he lowered the bar for me. But he doesn't, especially if you're sincere. I remember once, somewhere at the very end of all that years and years of effort, I had written something and I took it to Swami. It was so funny. It was like, I, as soon as his mind was on it, I could see its limitations. But when my mind alone was there, I couldn't. And he told me in that particular case, he said it was mental, it meaning that I'd, I'd intellectually created it. It, had, it, wasn't, it didn't inspire, it didn't come from my point of origin. But it was good. So he told me I could use it if I wanted to. I remember that really broke my heart. I was really crushed on that one because I had so hoped that, that I would have done it. But here's an interesting fact. Swami made the comment, just a categorical comment once. He said, no matter how stern and demanding Master was, which sometimes he was quite stern and quite demanding, Swami said, you always felt encouraged, even if you were scolded. You just always felt encouraged. Um, he said, whenever you feel discouraged, you, it's not God or Guru speaking to you. It's always Satan. Because Satan has a very subtle way. The darkness, the shadow, has a very subtle way of insinuating itself into us. And one of it is to make us feel discouraged. Because what's a, what is the most effective tactic to keep a devotee from moving toward the light? to have that devotee himself or herself lose hope. Just lose hope. I can't do it. 
this is just too hard. There was a, 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 a fellow disciple of Swamiji's when they were living at Mount Washington, and the man had many worldly inclinations. He had tremendous spiritual good karma, but he also was very drawn to many things that were going to take him off the path. And finally, he, those uh, alternate forces just got a hold of him, drew him out of the monastery, and drew him into a, 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 a downward spiral. And after a time, Swami Kriyananda saw him in the life that he was living at that point, and he'd just given up. He said, I've just, I've just gone so far down, I've just failed, I'm just get, not going to be able to recover. And Master, Master was so sad, not because of the life, the dissolute life he was living, that could be overcome, but because the disciple himself had lost hope. So whenever we feel discouraged, and it's, it's been a tremendous help to me to just have this thought in, my, in our minds. Because one of the things, I, I, I'll keep using the word Satan, because it helps us to realize it's a, it's a conscious energy, whether it's coming from ourselves or from outside. Master said that Satan is a real force, a real conscious force that tries to pull us away from the light. And what Satan does is Satan insinuates himself into our consciousness by use of our own false reasoning. And what Satan does is he persuades us that we have to relate to these false ideas. And so Amiji put it as an experience he had once when he was working very, very hard to build Ananda. And what that meant was he was, he was traveling all over the Bay Area, um, driving, you know, sometimes a couple of hours to, uh, of commuting back and forth to teach classes five nights a week to earn the money, to pay for the land, to buy the buildings. And he was in the car one night, and he said he literally just felt a cold, uh, you know, the virus of a cold. He felt it just come into his body. And viruses are living things with their own consciousness. He felt this cold come into his body. And, um, and, and he immediately thought, I can't afford to get sick. I just don't have the space or the time to get sick. But he also felt this idea coming over him. Oh, you work so hard. You know, it's only natural that you would want to take a break. If you just get sick, you can just stop. And he felt like it was Satan insisting that he relate to the virus. And, and all of a sudden, Swamiji said, he just felt, you know, this is not, this is not the truth. And I don't have to relate to this virus. And in his car all by himself, he, he said, get out, get out, just like that, really loudly. And he felt the virus just run away because it was a living thing and he refused to relate to it. So how many times with all of us, when something happens and this sort of discouraging thought comes in or this thought of how, you know, I'm overworked or I'm not capable or nobody really recognizes me and somebody owes me an apology, you know, just sort of all these things that come that make us feel discouraged. Satan, if we ever feel discouraged, Satan is insinuating himself with his false reasoning. And we don't have to relate to it. We just have to move out of that vibration. Because when we get in those moods, they're so real when we're in them. And then you come out of them, and you, you can't even remember. Why would I have thought that? So this, this statement of Master's, you know, he accepted us as we were, but he was uncompromising in what he asked of us, and we have to add a phrase to that because he knew we could do it. He knew we could do it. I have to say in all those years that I was struggling to learn to write, Swami, Swami always believed I could do it. And when I finally broke through sufficiently to write that first book, Swami Kriyananda, as we have known him, one of the things that enabled me to do it is after literally several years of struggling and just my psychology was just too twisted and boring to be worth repeating. 
but it existed. Finally, I realized that I was the only person who thought I couldn't do this, that all of my friends and Swamiji himself, they all believed I could do it. And I was the only one who thought I couldn't. And that, that just crossed my mind. What are the chances that they're all wrong and I alone am right? When has this ever happened? And that was the, that was the breakthrough point. If Swami had, had been more, if Swami had compromised his expectation of what I was capable of doing, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But he was kind, he was tremendously supportive. I never felt rejected or judged, but he never lowered the mountaintop. He never brought it down to where I was standing and gave me a medal for just showing up. Never. And it, that is a, it's a really fine line, but where it comes from, you see, is one actually has faith in other people. You're not, it's, not, it's not an affectation. And that faith, you know, that, that's an e- eternal kind of friendship that you have. It's not faith that you're going to get it right today. It's not faith that you're going to get the gold medal. It's not faith that this piece of art is really terrific art. It may be quite mediocre art, like Swami was with my writing. It just wasn't good enough, that's all. He said once to me, <laughs> so I think this was my favorite, you're not sure about what you want to say, so just to be sure you say it three times. <laughs> I really learned to write when I had to write advertising, and, and I had to write to design, which was the, the paper was designed first, and then I had to fill in a certain artistic square with words. So I'd written 150 words, for example, and I could only use 50 of them. And then I would go through that 150 words, I would pull out 50, the entire meaning would still be present. And that one made me wonder, what am I doing with all those other 100 words? And that was the sort of the turning point when I began to sort of understand what I was trying to do. But if Swami had been announced less compromising, now there's the last point I want to touch here, because this is the last line in this section. If you love yourself, how can you love God? And sometimes you say, but I don't love myself. I'm very down on myself. I'm full of doubt and compromise, and I'm, I'm dissing myself, if that's the right word, in every way that I think about it. But self-love is self-concern. If, if you are thinking about yourself, how you fit in, whether you're doing well or not, it's, it, you're, you're putting... Um, well... Self-realization, I used to think, when I first started, to become self-realized is to take essentially the person and the personality and the talents and the attitudes I have and to get every one of them perfect. You know, we sort of have this idea, I'll I'll be perfect. Self-realized, we think of perfection of the self that we presently identify with. We think we perfect this self and that that's God's realization. But that isn't so. The very identification and concern about this limited, egoically-based entity and all of its endless ramifications, who likes me, who doesn't, how nice I look today, what I'm wearing, who said this to me, what I said to them, whether I did my kriyas enough, whether I you know, was nice to this person or unkind to that one, whether I'm worried about this or free on that, just goes on and on and on. And that is the obstacle. It's like there, there's just, we, we shift our concern to being a, a, a flow of divine energy. And when that flow is there, and this is why creative work, this is why Swami writes the artist as a channel, A pathway, creativity is a pathway to self-realization. Many, many people are gifted with something you can do that utterly absorbs you, that causes you to forget your separate reality. A friend of mine who was getting a PhD in physics over at Stanford, and he said he he could go into his office there, 
he could sit down with his physics problems in the morning and he would look up and it would be nighttime. And he was a little concerned if this was okay. I said, you should thank God every day just before you dive into those physics because what was happening in the contemplation of this, you know, of the magnificence of the universe that he was working out with all his physics problems was that he would cease to exist. He would become nothing but that flow of energy. And if, if there's nothing to block that flow of energy, that is, that is, in a very real sense, the realization of the divine. The, the little self is forgotten in the contemplation of the greater. And people come to that. I Certainly when I finally began to understand what Swami was asking of me, it was no longer I writing something, and this really came through when I wrote Lightbearer, is but the book itself was manifesting through me, and it wasn't about me as the one doing it, it was the book itself manifesting, and it just had its own reality, and hours would pass, days and months would pass until the, the book was done. If you can find something that takes you there on its own, or if you can take yourself there by your concentration and your service. I actually experienced that same state of self-forgetfulness many times at the very beginning of my Ananda life when I was given responsibility for running the kitchen for, the, for what was a, a large part of the community and the retreat there. I just was so busy taking care of my 30 brothers and sisters who were depending on me for their meals, that my own place in the whole story, I just, it just didn't occur to me to think about it. Now, that's not how we always think about God realization, but that, that is what it is. And so when Swami, when Master says to Swami, if you love yourself, if you're standing there being self-satisfied about how much you love God, there's still a self in there. See, the irony of this is, and, and I'm sure many of you understand this, and if you don't, you will. It's like everything that people think is good about you is where you've managed not to be present. And that's how, that's one of the ways in which uh, advanced souls become very humble. Because someone can say, oh, you wrote such a beautiful book, you sang such a beautiful song, you did this, you did that. And the one who has done it for love for God knows that it was done, but there was no I to do it. By definition, the degree to which I was involved in that was the degree to which it was limited and not not so much what the divine had in mind. As Swami said, many great and beautiful things that God would give to this world never manifest for lack of a willing human instrument. Self-forgetfulness is self-perfection. Sounds ironic, but that's just what it is. If you love yourself, how can you love God? Just like every loving self keeps oneself in, in a state of duality. And wherever there's a state of duality, there's movement, there's, there's opposites, and where we're coming to, where we're coming to is a state of stillness and oneness. Swamiji said once in a satsang in India, as it were, he said, because creation is so complicated, we have this idea that God must be the most complicated of all. He said, but that complication is because of the vibrations of duality. And the closer you come to the center point, which is the divine, the more the duality, you know, becomes less and less until it ceases altogether and there is perfect stillness in the one. What could be simpler than perfect stillness in the one? And so this is what we're working with. Not to perfect the duality, but to abandon it altogether. If you love God, if you love yourself, how can you love God? And when you love God, yourself is automatically loved because it's absorbed, it's lost, it's, uh, it's found. 
I will lose myself. I will find myself in thy love. God bless you.